Welcome, everybody. Um, my name is Tom Christensen. I'm the moderator today for this panel on Korea's triangular relations. Um, I'm going to introduce all the speakers up front, and then they're going to speak for 20 minutes each, uh, and then there should be some time at the end for question and answer. Uh, closer to the mic, please. Closer to the mic. Thank you, Herb. <laughs> Constructive criticism. <laughs> um, I'll say something about myself. Um, I am a professor and I'm a director of the China the World program at Princeton University. And I used to serve in the State Department as Deputy Assistant Secretary for China, Taiwan, and Mongolia. Um, and I still serve as an advisor to the policy planning staff. And since we're on tape, I'm obliged to say that anything I might say up here, and I might not say anything because I'm just a moderator, um, <laughs> it's, just my own it's just my own opinion. Uh, it doesn't represent any uh, views of the U.S. government. Um, to my left is uh, Sumi Terry, and, um, and Dr. Terry is uh, a distinguished analyst of, uh, of Korea and East Asia. She worked several years at the CIA as an analyst. Uh, she served as a National Security Council Director for Korea and Japan um, at the tail end of the Bush administration, the beginning of the Obama administration, succeeding my friend Victor Cha. Uh, and she is uh, a, a senior research scholar at uh, my PhD alma mater, Columbia University, um, where she's at the Weatherhead East Asia, East Asia Center. Um, and she, you'll see her on CNN and uh, other places, and she's a very uh, distinguished commentator on East Asian politics. Uh, to her left is Evans Revere, who has a lot of distinct distinctions in his career, the most important of which is he's a graduate of Princeton University. <laughs> Um, but seriously, uh, he had a distinguished career in the State Department, which included a lot of uh, key posts, like being uh, Deputy Chief of Mission in Seoul, like being Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary of State, which is a very large notch above my position, because um, he had to run all the admin in a very large bureau. Um, and uh, he's been President of the Korea Foundation. Uh, he's been a Senior Fellow at Brookings, and he's now a Senior Director at the uh, Albright Stonebridge Group. Is that correct? That's the correct, correct title. Um, and I'm great. I'm really glad to see him because I thought he had pulled out, and it was really a pleasant surprise that he's here today. So, welcome, Evans. Uh, Sung Yun Lee, um, uh, to to the left of the uh, of the podium, um, is the Kim Koo Korea Foundation professor at the Fletcher School at Tufts University. Um, he is one of uh, the world's greatest commentators on North Korean politics in particular, but he's also uh, very adept at talking about the international relations of East Asia, as you'll discover today. Um, and uh, like others on this panel, he's a public intellectual of the, uh, of the uh, first degree in that he's always uh, seen and, uh, on, on, on electronic media and also in newspapers uh, commenting on important issues of the day. Um, to his left is the, the real official in the audience, um, is uh, uh, Dr. Alexander Lukin, who is uh, a scholar diplomat um, in, the, in the classic tradition. And he is the vice president um, at the Diplomatic Academy of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, for Ru in Russia. Um, he is also a professor at Moscow State University and a director of the Center for East Asian Studies there and for the Shanghai Cooperation Organization Studies there. Um, and I can say that he is one of the uh, leading experts on the history of Russian-China relations, and he's a very prolific author on those topics. Um, and I, I consider it a great honor because I'm kind of a closet diplomatic historian myself to be on the same panel as, as, as uh, Dr. Lukin at the end, um, Professor Lukin at the end. So um, we'll go in the order that I introduce these people. Uh, 20 minutes each, please. Please try to keep your comments to the 20 minutes because I'm sure these fine members of the audience would like to ask questions at the end. This way, everybody can see me. Good afternoon. Can you guys hear me? OK. Um, first, thank, big thanks to KEI and Gil Rosman and Nicholas and other folks who were, worked so hard to pull this panel together. Thank you very much. It's really a privilege to be here. Um, I'm usually not known for my optimism, but uh, let me begin with a very uh, moderately upbeat note uh, for a change when, you're talk when we're talking about Korea-Japan relations. The Obama, Pakune, Abe trilateral discussions that were held earlier this week at the Nuclear Security Summit were, while only a very tiny 
baby step forward, and I don't want to exaggerate its impact, but I think it was nonetheless an important first step forward in terms of bringing South Korea-Japan relations back on track, um, and one that could potentially weaken uh, Beijing's ability to further drive a wedge between these two very important key U.S. allies. From Washington's perspective, the current souring of relations between Japan and Korea is really no longer viable. Um, for U.S.'s pivot or this rebalancing to succeed, it must have cooperation between two uh, key US, U.S. allies in Northeast Asia, Korea, and Japan. But as we, this audience, is very well aware of, since the Obama administration's announcement of the pivot, the relationship between South Korea and Japan has deteriorated so considerably, uh, making it very difficult to have a united front in dealing with, from U.S. perspective, um, increasingly belligerent China and, of course, erratic uh, and really belligerent North Korea. So in my paper, uh, I have several sections, but the first section examines the various factors that are responsible for the downward trajectory of South Korea-Japan relations. And the second section examines the factors that are they could possibly pull the two powers together. And the third section examines how U.S. could bring um, these two allies into closer alignment as a part of uh, this uh, tripartite security relationship. But in the interest of time, uh, I think during my presentation today, I think I would like to focus mostly on about the factors that could bring these two countries together and what U.S. could and should do. Uh, in terms of um, uh, it bringing uh, these two allies together. And particularly because I think we are, this audience is very well aware of the long grievances on, and the issues that are exacerbating Seoul-Tokyo relations without my elaborating too much on them. I mean, you, you are too very well aware of this. Not only on the various issues of contention on the both sides, but I think we are aware of the both sides of the argument from the Korean side and from the Japanese side, whether that is the issue of the comfort woman whether it's a controversy over Dokdo Takashima issue, um, uh, or whether it's you know Yashikuni visits, um, textbooks, South Koreans' concerns of a possible Jap Japan's uh, constitutional revision, including Article 9, of course, and normalization of the military, and so on. We know we know both sides of the argument, but uh, allow me to mention just one factor to discuss, and I think it's important for us to just note this, even though we all know we all know this, which is the impact of the leadership, the current leadership that is in both South Korea and Japan. So, in addition to all these underlying factors um, or historical ter 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 territorial disputes, I think. It's the current leadership and personalities of Park geun and Prime Minister Abe themselves uh, that is further contributing to the strain in Seoul and Tokyo relations. As you know, as daughter of former President Park Jong-hee, President Park geun has a particular burden to avoid um, appearing too favorably towards Japan. Her, her father was an officer in Japan's army, was fluent in Japanese, as you know, um, and he signed a treaty in normalizing relations between Korea and Japan in 1965. So Park Geun-hye's domestic political foes uh, brand her, or like to brand her, father as pro-Japan, a powerful stigma for South Korean politicians, and a serious baggage for Park Geun-hye. And I think we, we, it, this is something that we need to understand. Um, and Park Geun-hye herself also has a history of being an advocate for comfort women in seeking restitution from Japan. So this particular issue is a personal, genuinely personal uh, issue for her. And it's, she's, I think, genuinely offended by Prime Minister Abe's stance on this issue. Abe, meanwhile, uh, is also well known for his outspoken nationalist views, uh, which does not bode well for South Korea-Japan uh, relations. And his comments and actions on controversial historical issues suggest that he has personally um, embraced a revisionist view, uh, which denies the history of Japan's empire, that it, Japan's empire was one that of unrivaled um, oppression and victimization of its neighbors. So the, my point is the current leadership in both South Korea and Japan is an important contributing factor in, in the deterioration of the South Korea-Japan relationship. 
All this said, I think there are a couple issues for us to consider. And first, I think it's important for us to remind, sort of remind, you know, remind ourselves that public perceptions are always in a constant flux. So in 2010, South Korea, uh, where, where there was a poll, and South Koreans viewed Japan as favorably as China back then. Now, less than four years later, Japan is viewed as unfavorable, unfavorably or even more unfavorably than North Korea. I think earlier this, uh, today, in earlier panel, it was already discussed that in a recent survey of rating of foreign leaders, Kim Jong-un came out of, ahead of Abe. This is, this is remarkable. This is something. I mean, and so while this is a reflection of how toxic Korea-Japan relations have become, I think it is also a sign of how public attitudes can change. So let us not forget that indeed only just a decade ago that South Korea-Japan relations uh, have, had reached the apex of their relations. In the 1990s, uh, Korea-Japan relations to be, uh, appeared to be trending up, right, with the Kono Statement in 1993, with the Murayama Apology in 1995. In 1998, when President Kim Dae-jung uh, initiated his sunshine policy towards North Korea, he employed a very similar strategy uh, in his engagement and dealings with Japan. Uh, and the highlight of the bilateral relations occurred in 1998 when during an official visit, Kim Dae-jung's official visit to Japan, uh, and, and both Kim Dae-jung and Prime Minister Obuchi declared at the time their intent to improve South Korea-Japanese relations through political, economic, uh, and security and cultural exchanges, which led to increased collaboration on regional security matters and dialogue between the two militaries. Cultural contact also uh, positively affected public perception of each country. So a Korean ban during that time, a Korean ban on Japanese cultural imports such as songs and movies was finally lifted. And you remember in 2002, South Korea and Japan co-hosted, uh, successfully co-hosted the World Cup. Korea's imports of Japanese products, including cars and electronic goods, in that, turning, uh, that time period between 2000 to 2008, surged some 82.9%. At the same time, Japanese, uh, you remember this when Japanese consumers got, became really fascinated with this Korean uh, singers and TV and soap operas and movie stars and so on as a part of this Korean wave or Hallyu of Korean pop culture. I still remember during that time when I was meeting Japanese officials, they would complain about their wives being fixated on some Korean soaps. And like, I remember Winter Sonata or some male character who was in that uh, soap. I sheepishly admit that I watched the entire Winter Sonata on one bout of flu that I had, but it was the one soap that I watched. But nonetheless, it was very popular with the Japanese. And then there was an increasing number of tourists or so followed on the heels of these uh, cultural exchanges. So when in 1965, uh, the number of people visiting the other country was approximately 10,000. It reached 2.52 million in 1996, and further increased to almost 5 million in 2007, and then in 2012, Korea Tourism Organization uh, figures show that 3.5 million Japanese accounted for the largest group of foreigners visiting uh, South Korea. So what this indicates to me is that history suggests that the current low in Korea-Japan relations could yield to another period of, of increased cooperation in light of right mixture of security and economic incentives. So in 1998, there, was, there were motivating factors for both sides to come together for the Obuchi Kim declaration. A year earlier, Japan faced a serious security crisis due to North Korea's test firing of missiles that sailed over Japan's mainland. Meanwhile, Kim Dae-jung came uh, into office in, in South Korea when South Korea was still reeling from the IMF financial crisis in 1997 and saw Japan as a potential source for assistance. So, and today, we still have First and foremost, we have the North Korean threat, right, it has not gone away. So since the mid-1990s, growing South Korean and Japanese concerns over the North Korean military threat have triggered 
tentative, at least tentative moves to improve bilateral uh, relations and military cooperation. And then this effort assumed greater urgency in the last few years after Pyongyang's uh, dangerous provocations. I mean, just look at since, I don't have to remind this audience since 2010 uh, what, has, what has occurred. Um, North Korea, since 2010, North Korea sank South Korean Corvette, uh, killing over 46 sailors, shelled South Korean island, Yampyong, killing four, uh, four citizens, and launched short-range missiles, third nuclear test, threatened war against Seoul and Washington. Japan clearly shares these concerns uh, with South Korea. Not only have North Korean missiles have been launched toward Japan and over and uh, through the Japanese airspace. Pyongyang has abducted, obviously, abducted Japanese citizens and has regularly threatened Japan. So we have the North Korean threat. There is also the China factor. Uh, China is another potentially, China is another potentially unifying common security concern. Although the threat perceptions, I admit, are different uh, in Tokyo and Seoul. Tokyo's obviously immediate concerns are China's military modernization program and actions regarding the Senkaku Dayo Islands. Uh, South Korea's concerns regarding China are obviously not as severe, and South Korean China's relations, as we all know, have dramatically increased, and it's generally good uh, right now, particularly these days. But still, there are concerns among the Koreans. There's anxiety about the China's rise, which is fostered by China's claim to the ancient um, uh, Korean Kingdom of Goguryeo, Chinese fishermen illegally fishing uh, in South Korean waters, Beijing's support of North Korea, uh, and the territorial dispute over Socotra, a submerged rock in the East China Sea known as Iodo uh, in Korean, and Suyan Rock to the Chinese. So, and the recently when China declared uh, an air defense uh, identification zone that included Iodo, Seoul obviously reacted very negatively. Uh, and despite the current souring of South Korea-Japan relations, South Korean officials know that improving military and intelligence capabilities or cooperation with Japan is beneficial to South Korea, to enhan in enhancing South Korean security. Japan also provides a critical base of support uh, for U.S. forces, which obviously uh, would defend South Korea during a potential conflict with North Korea. Japan would also likely be a potential economic contributor to Korean unification, you know, Korean unification is a big topic right now in Korea, but Japan will be a big economic contributor. They will contribute economic aid, food, medicine, even sending in civilian uh, and medical personnel. And in the longer term, developmental aid and assistance. Of course, besides North Korea and China, there is also a uh, com economic ties, close economic ties for us to consider. Japan is Korea's third largest trading partner in China. Right, China and China, and after the China and the U.S., while Korea is Japan's third largest export destination. So South Korea continues to rely on Japanese foreign direct investment uh, because Japan's niche technologies are needed to complete many of Korean uh, consumer products for export. So between 1962 to uh, 2011, Japan was Korea's second largest FDI provider with U.S. $28.2 billion, or 15% of the FDI. Japan's FDI in South Korea then more than doubled between 2011 to 2012 to hit almost $4.54 billion, which is more than $4 billion that Korea received from China, Taiwan, Hong Kong, Singapore, and Malaysia all combined. The external financial shocks for both countries that uh, from 2008 financial crisis uh, and the unforeseen natural disaster in, in Japan in March 2011 also brought, I think, new, new uh, momentum for Korea and Japan to map out uh, a new coordination strategy through enhanced cross-border FDI. Um, and since the earthquake, uh, Japan has been looking to relocate some of uh, the domestic parts, uh, components, factories to earthquake-free destinations of course, Korea proved to be the ideal destination, being lo located right next to Japan with only a few hours of delivery and time separating two locations. The point is this. Nationalism, we talked earlier about the national identity and nationalism, and yes, history and other contentious issues make a truly um, a triangular U.S.-Korea-Japan relationship difficult to achieve. And it's lag 
the South Korea-Japan relationship, we know it's not solid. Today, it is practically non-existent, and we know this. However, a more robust triangular security triangle, a structure uh, between the US, South Korea, and Japan is possible, I believe, given the right conditions. And stronger bilateral ties between Korea and Japan are critical from U.S.'s perspective uh, in light of growing North Korean threat and China security concerns to the region and declining budget of U.S. armed forces. And for Washington, it is all the more imperative that we do what we can to bring its close our Asian allies together. And it can start by facilitating contact and reconciliation on smaller and less contentious issues of mutual concern like it did earlier this week. Um, and if these initiatives bear fruit, then they could lead to a broader reconciliation effort in the future. Um, and the priority for the, for the U.S. is to, it should be to encourage the involvement of both Seoul and Tokyo in multilateral security structures and for Seoul and Tokyo to develop joint strategies for addressing common threats and objectives. And there are numerous areas in which all three countries can cooperate, including joint peacekeeping operations, counterterrorism, counterproliferation, counter narcotics, uh, cyberspace, humanitarian assistance, and you know various disaster operations. Um, there's also areas of maritime security. There's anti-submarine warfare, mine warfare, and missile defense. And missile defense, by the way, offers a particularly uh, fruitful area for cooperation. So and the U.S. has been making this effort, but it should continue to encourage trilateral missile defense cooperation exercises in order to implement a multi-layered regional uh, defense, missile defense network that includes both South Korea and Japan. And by linking U.S., South Korean, and Japan, uh, Japanese censors, the allies could better deter and, if needed, defeat potential North Korean uh, missile attack while, pro while, while uh, protecting vital U.S. military uh, capabilities based in Japan or Guam and minimizing the risk that a North Korean provocation could lead to an all-out conflict. And of course, other trilateral training can also occur far from the Korean Peninsula. The mine sweeping exercises can occur near the Strait of Hormuz, and joint patrols to combat Somali pilot, pirates can uh, we can do this in Gulf of Aden, and uh, for example. And this will not only serve common allied interests, but develop skills uh, and familiarity that could help us, uh, and that could be applied in a future potential Korean crisis. And beyond the military realm, there are two countries can work together in providing official development assistance to Southeast Asia and elsewhere. So for U.S., in many of these areas, U.S. could act as an honest broker facilitating progress and tempering down tensions. And if such prelim preliminary steps prove fruitful, then the U.S. could handle, uh, well, we can try to launch a more concerted diplomatic effort to try to resolve the outstanding issues between the two countries. And I know this sounds really improbable right now, but Secretary of State John Kerry right now is currently engaged in an active effort to bridge the historical differences between the Israelis and the Pal Palestinians, a process that you would admit that has scant chance of immediate success because in addition to everything else, uh, Israel is a pro-Western democracy and the Palestinian territories are not. So certainly there, I, there are significant differences between South Korea and Japan. I'm not trying to minimize that. And over a number of issues, and those issues will not easily be resolved. But South Korea and Japan are both pro-American de democracies with many shared interests and even elements of shared culture. Uh, which I believe the Israelis and the Palestinians lack. The odds of success, I would argue, of uh, South Korea-Japan talks actually uh, succeeding is higher than the Israelis and the Palestinian talks. So imagine if Kerry, Secretary Kerry was engaged in the kind of intensive shuttle diplomacy that between Tokyo and Seoul that Kissinger employed uh, in the 1970s to allow Israel to reach an agreement with its historic enemy, Egypt. Um, so the effort might still fail, but I think it's still worth uh, making this kind of effort, especially if Korea and Japan were to receive the kind of um, high-level 
focused American interest, uh, attention, which Israel and the Palestinian authorities currently receive. So my last point is South Korea-Japan relationship, I admit it's as troubled as any relationship in the world. I understand that. I understand the history. Um, and there's plenty of reasons why this should be so. But history does not really have to be destiny. And many other nations have overcome decades or centuries of tension um, and outright conflict to establish closer uh, working relationships. So, I mean, think of France and Germany. And so I believe that, call me an idealist, <laughs> but a uh, similar transformation could occur, uh, not anytime soon, because the, the relationship is so fraught uh, with many contentious issues. But there are many shared interests that, that bring these two neighboring states together. So with a little bit of push from Washington, I think it's possible, um, maybe even probable, but at least possible, that uh, they will be able to enhance their cooperation uh, with each other, uh, with the U.S. It will make Northeast Asia uh, more prosperous and secure. Thank you. Um, our next speaker is Evans Revere. I wanted to take the opportunity to reiterate something that, uh, that Dr. Terry said at the beginning, which is uh, thanks very much to the, uh, the KEI America uh, staff and for, for the, or to the organization for hosting this. Uh, uh, Nicholas Hamasevich has been great, um, and uh, so have so other members of your team, and we really appreciate it. Now, Evans is going to set up. I promise not to step on it. <laughs> Thank you. I hadn't planned on uh, standing up and delivering a lecture, but uh, in light of the fact that folks over there won't be able to uh, see my smiling face here, I thought it might be appropriate to, uh, to move the lectern. Uh, let me begin by adding my thanks to uh, the thanks that's just been expressed uh, to KEI for putting this panel and, and so many other uh, good panels together. Uh, it's a, a real tribute uh, to the, uh, the energy and the leadership that the organization uh, shows when it comes to uh, uh, U.S.-Korea relations and Korea's relations with the rest of the world. It's uh, a very special honor for, uh, for me to be here, uh, uh, particularly uh, in light of the uh, incredibly distinguished cast of characters that you have be, uh, before us. And, uh, uh, I'm by no means distinguished, but I am a character, but uh, I'm, I'm delighted to be here and, and join them. And it's also great to be able to uh, address the uh, uh, American Association of Asian Studies audience and members again. Uh, I think right at the outset, in the interest of uh, full disclosure, I should warn you that I have a, a certain history uh, with this forum. Uh, almost exactly four years ago today, I was standing in a room just a few, uh, few doors down here, and in the midst of my remarks, uh, we had what I like to describe as a Blackberry moment, uh, where about 20 people's Blackberries, including my own, went off, and as I glanced down quickly to see what the messages were, I was getting messages from friends in Korea's Ministry of Defense and DOD and the State Department uh, telling me that North Korea had just sunk a South Korean warship. And I was convinced at that moment that by the end of my talk we were going to be at war on the Korean Peninsula and told the audience at that, that and uh, maybe it was a credit to my brilliance as a speaker that day, but no one left. Uh, in any event, I hope uh, today's presentation uh, will go a bit smoother than that one uh, four years ago. Uh, I think it's, it's true that uh, speakers at fora like these uh, always like to begin by saying how timely uh, these meetings are. Well, uh, I'm going to say that. Uh, this is timely. Uh, in this case, it's, it's particularly true because uh, over the past week we have seen various aspects of the uh, U.S. ROK China uh, triangular relationship uh, that I'm going to talk about and the ROK's other regional triangular relationships play out in real time in The Hague. So uh, that's a very important uh, affirmation that what we are here in this room addressing today uh, is not something abstract or theoretical, it's something very concrete uh, and from a political and diplomatic and security uh, perspective, uh, it's reality. Uh, and being a person who likes to live in the real world, uh, there you have it. 
Uh, I have been asked, as I said, to talk about the U.S. Uh, ROK China Triangle, uh, and I've actually subtitled my talk with a, a question. Uh, old game, new game, or end game? And I've done that as a way of trying to frame my effort to describe the nature uh, of the still developing trilateral dynamic uh, among these three countries and also as a way of trying to get at the question about what this uh, relationship has the potential to accomplish uh, in the coming years. Uh, Bob Dylan, who doesn't often get cited at AAS meetings, uh, once wrote that uh, something is happening but you don't know what it is. Uh, the good news about this developing triangular relationship uh, between Seoul, Washington, and Beijing is that while we may not yet know what this complex relationship is ultimately going to produce uh, in terms of new dynamics between and among the parties and in the region, uh, it does seem clear uh, that something very important with very far-reaching implications is indeed happening here. Uh, let me first address the South Korea-China leg of this triangle since it's the one that's been the focus of uh, so much uh, attention lately. Uh, it is obviously true that the foundation of the Republic of Korea, South Korea's national security, remains its alliance with the United States. So it was no surprise that uh, the first visit by the newly inaugurated South Korean President Park Geun-hye uh, back in 2013 was to the United States where she had a tremendously successful visit. Uh, but her second major overseas visit was to China where she was feted in grand style and given the sort of welcome that China usually reserves uh, only for very close friends. And I think looking at that as it evolved at the time, it was evident from the way that she was received and the treatment that she was being accorded that Beijing was sending a very clear and strong message, not only about its desire to get off on the best possible footing with a new South Korean president, but also about its desire to take its relationship with South Korea to a new level. Uh, it was also clear, at least from my perspective, uh, that her initiative in traveling to China, that uh, President Park was very determined to make uh, diplomacy and relationship building with Beijing uh, a major priority of her tenure as president and Beijing was clearly prepared to uh, reciprocate and work with her towards that same end. Uh, the motivations of the two countries, of both the ROK and the PRC, in pursuing this uh, interesting relationship, uh, I don't think the motivations are, are very hard to grasp, and let me just go over them very quickly. I think for South Korea's new president, Park Geun-hye, there was the fact that her predecessor had had a very difficult relationship with his Chinese counterpart and with other senior Chinese. And uh, Madam Park, President Park, was determined to do better. I think there was also the hope in Seoul to try to create a new dynamic in ties with China with respect to North Korea, the DPRK. For Seoul, China is obviously an essential partner in managing relations with North Korea. As North Korea's sole treaty ally and main provider of aid, China and Chinese cooperation and support are essential to North Korea's survival. And I think President Park's investment in better relations with Beijing was both a recognition of this obvious and important, but important fact but also an attempt to see if the ROK might be able to try to put some daylight uh, between Beijing and Pyongyang. Uh, China, of course, uh, in the run-up to her visit and the years before her visit, had provided and had continued to provide some very important diplomatic cover and political support for North Korea at some very crucial junctures, uh, particularly after, as I suggested earlier, the sinking of the, uh, uh, by North Korea of the ROK warship Chonan. And this uh, had the effect, China's actions of providing cover for the North Koreans had the effect of hampering South Korea's effort, efforts at the time to punish and, and isolate uh, North Korea. But the North Korean attack on Yonpyeong Island uh, a few months later that year raised some clear concerns in Beijing about North Korean behavior and the potential for provocations to lead to a much broader military conflict, and you'll recall that there was considerable potential along those lines at the time, I think this opened the door 
uh, to the possibility of just the sort of outreach that we saw from uh, the, uh, the new ROK president when she took office. I think another goal of President Pak's outreach related to her advocacy of uh, the so-called Northeast Asia Peace and Cooperation Initiative. Uh, this has been, uh, and still is, a core element of her diplomatic and regional security policy aimed at building uh, new intra-regional relationships among the countries of, of Northeast Asia and also aimed at trying to solve the so-called Asia paradox in which the, the very lively and positive trade and economic relations uh, that exist among most of the region's actors stand in very sharp contrast to the region's difficult and sometimes dangerous political and security challenges. Uh, towards this end, I think from the South Korean president's perspective, a more cooperative regional environment required uh, better relations with the region's largest resident player, China. Finally, and perhaps most importantly, I think President Park's move towards Beijing uh, relates to her vision for solving the seven-decade-old division of the Korean Peninsula and building a foundation for the eventual reunification of the peninsula. Neither of those two goals, uh, resolving the division and building the foundation for reunification, uh, is achievable without China's cooperation. It's a fact. And if Seoul's goal is to achieve reunification of the peninsula under the Republic of Korea's rule, and there's no doubt in my mind that that is what Seoul is after, this requires developing a vastly better relationship with China. It means raising China's comfort level, so to speak, with the idea of a reunified Korean peninsula. There's work to be done there. And I think it also requires raising China's confidence level that a reunified Korean peninsula under Seoul's rule would not undermine China's security. There's no question that those latter goals that I just mentioned uh, will not be easy to achieve, uh, but their attainment is essential if Seoul is to achieve its long-term dream and goal of national reunification. So I think it seems likely that President Park's effort to reach out to Beijing <laughs> in a way that was pretty unprecedented for a South Korean president. I think this is the beginning of a period of intensive diplomacy aimed at selling the idea of a ROK-led reunified Korean peninsula to China and in the course of doing that trying to take advantage of what many South Koreans uh, see as a uh, weakening in the traditional ties between Beijing and Pyongyang. Uh, let me turn to China's stake in this improved relationship with South Korea. China's efforts to build solid ties with this new Korean president grew in part out of Beijing's discomfort uh, with her predecessor, uh, who was seen as having adopted an unnecessarily hard and sometimes even confrontational line towards Pyongyang in the minds of, of many Chinese. Uh, relations between Seoul and Beijing under Im myung bak were less than ideal, to put it politely, and uh, Im myung baks clear solidarity with the United States in efforts to increase pressure uh, on the Pyongyang regime did not sit well, usually, with Beijing. I think President Park's election as president gave the PRC a chance to reset ties with Seoul, and I think that is the process that we uh, see the two countries engaged in right now. Beijing was almost certainly pleased with President Park's advocacy of uh, her so-called trust politique uh, outreach to North Korea and her emphasis on relationship building with the North through dialogue and cooperation. And those are themes that I think uh, were generally consistent with the uh, Chinese approach on North Korea that we've seen in recent years. So I think in this sense, Beijing may have believed that uh, she was uh, more, much more of a kindred spirit than Im myung bak ever was. But I think it's useful to keep in mind at this point that both Beijing and Seoul, at least in my view, seem to have overestimated Pyongyang's willingness to engage positively with South Korea. Pyongyang's response to President Park Geun-hye's trust politic and also their response to her advocacy of reconciliation has alternated between suspicion and contempt. 
Only this week we have seen the ad hominem attacks on President Park from North, by North Korea resume. And uh, Kim Jong-un's recent call to his military commanders to prepare for peninsular war next year uh, does not inspire optimism, at least by me, uh, that Pyongyang is going to be receptive to the overtures that President Park laid out in her speech in Dresden just a few hours ago. Beijing, I think, uh, surely understands all of this, but nevertheless, I think, continues to see President Park as a pragmatic leader with whom it can work, and with whom it can work to keep tensions low and perhaps even entice North Korea back to the negotiating table. Uh, Beijing is making an investment in better ties with Seoul, and I think that investment also reflects China's rising frustration with Pyongyang and a desire to send Pyongyang a message that China has options beyond just continuing its traditional support for the North Korean regime and toleration of the regime's uh, noted excesses. Uh, several things have probably contributed to Beijing's frustration, and these things will be familiar to you, uh, things like the unprecedented threats that we saw from uh, Pyongyang uh, last year, uh, the declaration of North Korea's intention to use nuclear weapons against its neighbors and against the United States, uh, and the growing consensus among experts, including many Chinese experts, that the DPRK has no intention of giving up its nuclear weapons. I think all of these developments and more have unnerved uh, China and have done so enough to convince uh, China's leadership that it should at least hint that it is determined to keep all of its options open when it comes to North Korea. Having said that, uh, China, I don't think, is prepared and will be prepared anytime soon to cut the cord with Pyongyang. But I think China is interested in reminding the DPRK that China's interests in the region extend beyond North Korea. And that's probably not a bad thing to remind North Korea of from Beijing's perspective. I think it's possible, maybe even likely, that uh, in firming up relations with Seoul, Beijing sought to reciprocate President Park's interest in improve relations uh, and, and to reciprocate uh, President Park's effort to uh, improve relations. I think one of the goals of Beijing here was perhaps to try to drive a wedge between Seoul and Washington and also between Seoul and Tokyo. Uh, China has witnessed, as Sue has already pointed out, a serious deterioration in South Korea-Japan uh, ties. Uh, those ties have taken a nosedive, a precipitate nosedive, over the last couple of years. And with that, uh, so has the once solid framework of cooperation between Seoul, Tokyo, and Washington on major regional security issues, uh, particularly North Korea. And with the fraying of that uh, trilateral uh, cooperation, uh, Beijing may have sensed an opportunity to try to wean South Korea away from its de facto linkage to the U.S.-Japan security nexus. Uh, President Park's frosty relationship with uh, Japanese Prime Minister Abe has probably encouraged China in this regard. Uh, and I think the jury is still out on whether the recent Hague summit will do anything to improve ROK Japan ties, but hope springs eternal. Uh, so today we find uh, Beijing continuing its effort to show solidarity with Seoul in the uh, South Koreans' reaction to uh, Japanese Prime Minister Abe's visit to the Yasukuni Shrine, the comments by senior Japanese officials suggesting Japan might revise or even retract some of its past statements of apology and regret and the claims by some in Seoul that Japan's leaders are taking the country in a rightward and more militant direction. Uh, Beijing is happy to pile on uh, when Seoul expresses those concerns. Uh, so each of the two poles of this triangle, Seoul and Beijing, uh, see value in improving uh, their ties for similar and dissimilar reasons. And now for the third poll, Washington, uh, let me suggest that this is not necessarily a bad uh, development. I think a reduction in suspicion and an increase in transparency between Seoul and Beijing is not a bad thing. Neither is planting the seed in the minds of China's leadership that there could be an alternative future for the Korean Peninsula that involves an end to provocative behavior on its border 
and the elimination of the North Korean nuclear and conventional threats. All of those things could be brought about through the establishment of a reunified Korea uh, under the rule of a government that would not pose a security threat to China or to any of its other neighbors. An improved China ROK relationship would also not mean a reduction in US ROK cooperation, I don't think. The United States is and can be expected to remain South Korea's sole ally and security partner and the sole guarantee or guarantor of South Korea's survival as long as the ROK desires the United States to play this role. There are also, I think, some very natural limits to how close the ROK will want to get to a Chinese a regime with which it shares so few core values. Uh, a PRC that remains a treaty ally of North Korea and a China whose last intervention on the Korean Peninsula was in support of the DPRK's efforts to eliminate the Republic of Korea and absorb the South into the North by force. Um, in this connection, I think it's very helpful to remember that there are also issues of history between Korea and its giant neighbor that have already been uh, referred to by Sue, and these have yet to be resolved. So to put all this another way, Beijing and Seoul have a long way to go when it comes to building relations of trust and confidence between them, uh, even though I think they've gotten off to a good start. But for the United States, which is the longest and strongest leg, I think, in this complex triangle. The process of improving ties between Beijing and Seoul can be helpful, particularly if it serves to underscore that Pyongyang is and will remain the odd man out in the region as long as it continues on the course that it's on. And especially, uh, uh, I think this will be a favorable development for the United States if it allows regional players to at least begin to think about a fundamentally reshaped and more stable Northeast Asia that would result from the reunification of the Korean Peninsula. So let me end uh, very briefly by just trying to answer the question I posed at the outset. Uh, clearly, this emerging geometry of ROK US-China relations is something very different from the old game. Something new is clearly afoot. But it remains to be seen whether that something new could lead to the end game on the Korean Peninsula. And that end game is something that could bring about the national reunification of Korea and the peace and stability that the entire region wants. So let me end there. Thank you. Our next speaker is Professor Sung Yun Lee from uh, Tufts University. Thank you. Either you are with us or with you're with the terrorists, intoned a U.S. president on September 20th, 2001, at a joint session of Congress. That remark drew widespread derision from self-styled sophisticates to ordinary observers for its simplistic, manichaean, and alarmist and alarming view of the world although that statement was really no different from what Hillary Clinton had said one week earlier when she said in the wake of the terrorist attacks, every nation has to decide whether it's with us or against us. George Bush was ridiculed for his simplistic ideological Manichaean view of the world Although in terms of its open-ended impracticability and unnecessarily threatening nature, that statement was no more illogical than a celebrated presidential inaugural speech 40 years before that spoke of the U.S. resolve to, quote, bear any burden, pay any price, meet any hardship, support any friend, oppose any foe in order to assure the survival and success of liberty." End quote. We all like to see shades of gray, but international politics, when it comes down to it, to war, nuclear diplomacy, it is about choosing sides. And for Korea, in its history, 
Perhaps there has never been a more compelling need to choose the right side as in a great war. A war that ravaged the nation, a war that drove most of the Korean people away from their dwellings, including the top leadership that sought refuge in a distant corner of the peninsula, a war that saw the Chinese cross the Yalu River and racing down through Pyongyang and Seoul, confining their adversaries mainly to the southern half of the peninsula, a war in which the Koreans had no say in the operational command or control in prosecuting the war, no say in the drawn-out truce negotiations, a war that ended after years of feral fighting without clear-cut victory, sans indemnity or ceded territory, but a war in which all the major belligerents claimed victory, whereas there was no doubt as to who were the biggest losers. Obviously, I refer to the Imjin Weran, known as Hideyoshi's invasions. The great, the most spectacular manifestation of triangular tensions among the states of Korea, Japan, and China. I mention this war because in South Korea today, there is a two-part volume history on, uh, on this war and its after effect, focusing more on the Manchu invasions several decades later. That has been turned into a morality play by an historian at Myeongji University, Han Myeonggi. And Professor Han's point is this. We are today, South Korea today, is caught up in a fundamental power shift in the region. Like Joseon Korea in the 1590s and early 1600s, caught up between a rising power, the revisionist Manchus 400 years ago, and the declining Ming, and today a rising revisionist state in China and a fading, declining status quo state in the United States and that we must choose wisely. Well, in the earlier period, the Korean king, King Injo, misread, if you will, the strategic environment, kept steadfast, loyal to the Ming, and as a result, invited a devastating, humiliating invasion by the Manchus first in 1627 and 1636. It's clear that China is not South Korea's enemy. It is also clear that Japan today is not South Korea's enemy. But the fundamental strategic configuration in Northeast Asia that has been in place since the first days of the Cold War, dating back to the Korean War of 1950, where you have a US-led contingent of Japan, South Korea, and the US, versus, in the other side, Russia, China, and the DPRK still remains in place today. Despite the bonhomie and the great reception and hospitality that President Park Geun-hye received in Beijing on her state visit in late June last year, if you look at the joint statement, buried beneath summit pageantry and diplomatic language is the following statement, an example of classic Chinese ambidexterity in managing others. Quote, the Repub Republic of Korea side expressed worry at the DPRK's continued nuclear testing and explicitly stated that it will never recognize the DPRK's possession of nukes in any circumstances. Sentence one. Sentence two. The two sides unanimously hold the view that nuclear weapon development seriously threatens peace and stability in Northeast Asia, including the Korean Peninsula and the world. Last sentence. The two sides affirm that achieving denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula and maintaining peace and stability there is in the common interest of all parties and they unanimously agree to work for this. What is missing in this statement, ladies and gentlemen, what is conspicuously absent is Chinese subject-verb agreement. 
And when you, as a child, learn grammar or a new language, we know that subject-verb agreement is essential to any coherent statement. The very first sentence, let me read it to you again. The ROK side expressed worry that the DPR, at the DPRK's continued nuclear testing and it will never recognize the DPRK's possession of nukes in any circumstances. It's completely, entirely omitted what China's position on the DPRK's continued testing and its nuclear arsenal is. The second sentence fails to identify just whose nuclear weapons development the two sides are addressing. Whether the US extended nuclear deterrence to South Korea is also accounted for under this indictment or not is left unsaid. Most problematic is the third sentence. The two sides affirm that achieving denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula and maintaining peace and stability there is the common goal. That formulation, denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula as opposed to denuclearization of the DPRK, made its international debut in the six party talks in the joint statement of September 19, 2005. It was a stunning concession by South Korea and the United States. Denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula has a specific meaning in North Korean and Chinese parlance and they tell you what that is. It is the abrogation of the us ROK alliance and the goal of dislodging South Korea from the US nuclear umbrella. The point that I'm making here is there was no concession won in this summit beyond all the good feelings and great reception and hospitality. There was nothing of substance that South Korea won from China, yet there was this euphoria in, in the weeks following the summit that maybe China was now on our side, maybe China will put real pressure on North Korea on the nuclear issue, the same kind of unfounded optimism that we saw in Washington in the wake of China's often repeated frustration and hostile rhetoric toward the DPRK in the aftermath of North Korea's nuclear test on February 12th last year. That kind of misreading of China's fundamental strategic interests in the peninsula is an amalgamation of overreading of Chinese frustrations at North Korea and again misreading of Chinese history and ongoing strategic interests. You might then say, well at least South Korea won from China a concession or a gift in the building of a memorial hall in honor of the South Korean patriot An jung who killed shot and killed Ito Hirobumi on October 26, 1909 at a railway station in Harbin. Park Geun-hye made that request purportedly to Xi Jinping and she went several steps further and not only built a statue in honor of An jung which is what President Park had re requested, but built an entire structure, protective structure over the statue. That created some tension and back and forth between South Korea and Japan and China and Japan. The chief cabinet secretary even last year in November 2013 saying that An jung -gun is quote a criminal and when that memorial hall opened earlier this year on January 19th, Mr. Suga said Japan recognizes An jung -gun as a terrorist who killed our first prime minister and that prompted an emotional response from South Korea with a prominent politician and the foreign ministry spokesperson saying various things about Japan's so-called terrorist actions in Korea in the first half of the 20th century. A couple of days later, China joined the fray and uh, the foreign ministry spokesperson said, quote, An jung -gun is in history an upholder of justice who fought against Japan's aggression. If An jung -gun were a terrorist, what about the 14 Class A war criminals of World War II honored in the Yasukuni Shrine? If the establishment of the An jung -gun Memorial Hall were a tribute to the terrorist, what about the Japanese leader's visit to the Yasukuni Shrine where Class A war criminals are enshrined?" End quote. I personally support wholeheartedly the building of that memorial in honor of An jung -gun and President Park's request 
to have that memorial built in honor of An Jung Lun in both principle and in terms of historical viewpoint is without reproach. But that kind of request should have come from a lower level Korean bureaucrat to a lower level Chinese bureaucrat. Because that kind of personal request from the head of South Korea to the head of China created the impression in Japan that the two countries were colluding with each other against Japan. And that is not in South Korea's or America's or Japan's strategic interest. I think the task of remembrance, commemoration, and rectification of history is best left to historians, academics, and when really necessary, mid-level bureaucrats rather than head of state. Korean, Koreans, South Korea, as you all know, has shown complex feelings toward Japan and the United States at various times over the past several decades. I would say, however, there is no organized anti-Chinese movement in South Korea. There is no visceral anti-Chinese sentiment in South Korea, which is fortunate, of course, which is good. But at times, that kind of mature collective equanimity displayed against China whenever China infringes on Korean sovereignty is not indicative of the South Korean government's real politique in terms of its alignment with its allies in the region. In real terms, at times, South Korea has shown, the government has shown a romantic attachment to China to the detriment of its alliance with the United States. Let me just mention one example. In 2005, the South Korean president in February spoke of South Korea assuming the role of the balancer in the region. That drew intense criticism, of course, from the opposition party and its leader, Park Geun-hye, as detrimental to South Korean interest. Whatever that meant was displayed quite explicitly by government figures, explained. It meant inching away from the United States, closer toward China, South Korea making sure never to be involved in any kind of military operation started by the United States, and also elevating military ties with China while downgrading ties with Japan. And then the next month in March, Japan unnecessarily provoked South Korea by declaring so-called Takeshima Day. And that led, prompted the South Korean president to make a very provocative statement that South Korea is on the verge of, quote, a diplomatic war with Japan. And that statement drew criticism from Park geun and many others, including Americans, who were genuinely concerned about the state of the alliance. There is always the danger that romantic attachment to China at a cost to South Korea's relationship with the US and Japan may translate into real policy. Now, that would not be a problem if it were not for the fact that triangular relations among nation states, like triangular relations among individuals, can be sordid, convoluted, and toxic. And may I say, since we are on the record, I speak not from first-hand experience, but my <laughs> observation. <laughs> there may come a day when South Korea may desperately need Japan's support in raising issues vis-a-vis -vis China. For example, with the next serious North Korean provocation or attack. The fact that it's been a year or so since North Korea's last major provocation, which was its nuclear test in February last year, and the fact that almost a year has passed since North Korea's bluster barrage that lasted through March and half of April last year, has led to the impression in Seoul and perhaps Washington as well that things are better and that North Korea, by virtue of talking to South Korea with the resumption of vice ministerial level talks in February for the first time since 2007, that North Korea is unlikely to do anything anytime soon. Let me just briefly remind you, ladies and gentlemen, that strategic deception is an essential component of North Korean statecraft, intentional deception, and let me just give you two or three 
most prominent examples. One week before the invasion of Korea, the greatest gamble by North Korea ever, North Korea suggested interparliamentary talks, even with a dateline, schedule of meetings, and so forth. And then on June 25th, uh, launched a systematic, widespread, well-prepared invasion. It was very important for North Korea to unsettle the minds of the South Koreans so as to make that attempt at completing the revolution work. When Kim Jong-il was anointed heir in the early 80s, the Kim father and son made a trip to China in June 1983 to win China's blessing. And when the Chinese reluctantly said, OK, uh, the Kim father and son conveyed a message to China that it wanted direct talks with the United States to send out a smokescreen. Because this was an important operation for North Korea in order to build up Kim Jong-il's non-existent military credentials, he had to prove himself. So North Korea planted a bomb for the South Korean president and his delegation in the Martyrs Mausoleum in Rangoon, Burma on October 9, 1983. The previous day was the last time that Deng Xiaoping or Beijing had served in the role as intermediary in conveying that message of wish to talk to Americans from the DPRK to Washington. The next day the bomb went off. The Chinese were immensely irritated because they had lost face. There are more recent examples. Um, we uh, heard of the sinking of the Chonan in March 2010. On March 3rd, North Korea called for military talks with the South. And then on the 26th of March, blew up the Korean ship. Later that year, um, the last day of the reunion of separated family members took place on October 30th, and then in November, November 11th, North Korea called for talks on the resumption of uh, the Kaesong, uh, pardon me, the Mount Kumgang tourism site, and then on the 23rd of November, shelled an inhabited island, killing four South Koreans. My point is. Uh, strategic deception, smoke screen, intentional mixed signals are a major part of North Korea's strategy and we, would, we should not be surprised or shocked if North Korea were to launch a limited but lethal attack or something of that nature uh, anytime soon. And at that moment, I think there will be a moment of clarity, perhaps a fleeting moment of clarity, but a moment of clarity that Japan is South Korea's tacit ally and that China is South Korea's unstated adversary. Perhaps South Korean leaders, in closing may I say, perhaps South Korean leaders will come to view their strategic environment in starkly clear terms that the fictional characters in The Matrix who inhabited a virtual reality did when Morpheus tells Nemo, the character played by Keanu Reeves, if you are not one of us, you are one of them. May I say that what I have said with you represents my views only and not the views of the Fletcher School or the Kim Go Foundation or the Korea Economic Institute. Thank you. <laughs> Our next speaker is uh, Professor Lucan. Yes. No, I have the power phone here. Could yep. you switch on the, the screen? Well, thank you very much for inviting me to this important event. Um, Could you please turn on the screen? And, uh, well, thank you especially for calling me as all of us public intellectuals. Well, I'm not sure about intellectuals, but we are all public figures in Russia, and I'm not sure at all to be on record today, because, well, for you Americans, maybe it's in something new as a matter of last one or two years, but being born, born in the Soviet Union, I knew from my childhood very well that I've always been on record, <laughs> even at home. <laughs> Now you also know this very well. <laughs> so, um, uh, uh, first of all, let me tell you that this 
paper that I wrote, uh, I wrote with uh, uh, Professor Denisov, uh, who couldn't come here, but uh, he is also a very important public intellectual in Russia and now a professor and previously worked uh, as a Russian ambassador to DPRK. And my special thanks uh, to Professor Rosman, who made my paper uh, good English out of, bed, out of my bad Russian. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, uh, I should probably begin saying some general words about Russia's foreign policy because, well, you spoke here, well, previous speakers spoke about many countries of the region, but nobody spoke about Russia, so maybe I'll, I add Russia to the, to the picture. Uh, uh, so the pragmatic foreign policy course under the leadership of uh, President Putin is now free, or at least free of ideology, both communist ideology and early yes, Yeltsin's uh, Westernism and is directed at forming around Russia an independent center of power. Uh, this policy foresees the establishment of normal uh, partnership relationship with all countries and uh, above all Russia's neighbors. Uh, this is necessary both for development of economic relations which are direct directed at uh, strengthening the economic power in Russia, uh, of Russia and that world recognition of, of Moscow as an important uh, center of power. Um, Asian neighbors are especially important for Russia since they make possible the diversification of Russian foreign policy activity uh, and uh, also uh, in the East Russia's political and economic models meets with much more understanding than in the West. Um, uh, so I'll begin with Russia's approach to uh, Korea and f uh, first to North Korea. Uh, Russia, for very pragmatic reasons, is interested in peace and stability on the Korean Peninsula. Although cooperation uh, and uh, through cooperation with both Korean countries, Russia is interested in security of its borders consequently in the political stability of both Korean states. Any war or loss of control in developments of the peninsula uh, in consideration of the presence in North Korea of nuclear weapons could easily di uh, directly affect the uh, Russian territory. And here you can see a picture of uh, civil, uh, civil defense uh, exercises in uh, the Russian Far East, which took place on several occasions, usually after a new, uh, after, after a new uh, nuclear test in North Korea. So Russia is very serious about it. Both Koreas are economic partners of Russia, with South Korea, um, Russia's third trading partner in Asia, and China and Japan uh, after China and Japan, and is important investor in, Ru in the Russian economy. Such cooperation plays an especially big role for the Russian Far East, uh, the development of which, which is, of course, Russia's, uh, Russia's one of the most Russia's, uh, uh, most important Russia's strategic uh, goal. Uh, it is also significant that Ties with, uh, ties with it serve as a useful balance for what many consider to be one-sided dependency of, on China. Well, I don't think so, but there are people who think so. Trade with, uh, mm, uh, trade with North Korea is not large, but after all, it is, it's a neighboring country, and you don't choose your neighbors, as somebody said. By the way, once I spoke there was a seminar on North Korea in Finland, and I said this, so this phrase that you don't choose your neighbors, and they laughed for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, 
So uh, Russia is interested in a quick resolution of uh, the nuclear problem of uh, North Korea. Uh, for this, it actively cooperates with all of the partners in the six-party talks, or at least cooperated. Uh, so uh, talking about uh, relations with North Korea, uh, we can say that over the past 10 years, the two sides have signed more than 40 intergovernmental and interagency agreements. Uh, in, uh, in the year mm, 2000, uh, a treaty of 19, uh, 1961 was replaced, removing the mutual defense requirement. Formally, uh, thus for formally ending the alliance and the role of a shaped ideology in favor of the principles of international law. Uh, trade, as I said, w was in quite insignificant, about 100 to 150 million dollars per year, reflecting North Korea's difficulty in supplying, well, they don't pay, basically. <laughs> That's the idea. <laughs> um, Russia, uh, uh, yes, the, these factors make it possible to realize much advertised triangular projects with South Korea, uh, which were uh, signed, or at least discussed, or agreed on during Kim Jong Il's visit in August uh, 2011 to Russia. These projects included a gas, pipe, a gas pipeline uh, through uh, North Korean territory to South Korea, a railroad uh, the same direction, and uh, elec electric uh, sales of electricity to North Korea. Uh, but two, two smaller projects have recently been uh, realized. And the big step forward for bilateral re relations was that in September uh, 2012, an agreement was signed on North Korea's debt, uh, debt to Russia. This is Mr. Kim Jong-un uh, bordering the train. You know that North Korean leaders only go by trains. They don't, they, they don't go by, uh, by any other means of transport. So, Mr. Kim Jong Il made two two trips to Russia by train. Went through all, all the way to Trans-Siberian. I think it's about 7,000 kilometers. Uh, the deeper uh, the North Korean missile and nuclear actions uh, have had a negative influence on bilateral relations. Moscow has continuously stood for non-nuclear uh, non Korean Peninsula, does not accept uh, North Korea's nuclear status, and participates in international sex, uh, sanctions that were imposed by the Security Council. Uh, Russia directly participated in preparing Security Council rocket and nuclear resolutions 1695 and 1718, on December 2, two uh, last year, a presidential order was signed on fulfilling Security Council Resolution 2094. Uh, Russia remains convinced that um, a resolution of the, North uh, of the North Korean nuclear program must be found strictly through political diplomatic means, uh, through restoration of the six-party talks. Uh, well, Russia and South Korea. Political and economic uh, relationship between Moscow and Seoul helping today stably. This is uh, facilitated by mutual economic interests. South Korea is uh, Korea's interested in resources and Russia is interested in investment. Also, we don't have any problems with North Korea. Any border problems like with some other countries in the region, or any apprehension of its growth with, with some other countries. Uh, geopolitical situation is uh, uh, complicated. Uh, uh, 
uh, well, the, as, as I said, that we uh, the it, it co uh, com co complicated relationship between Seoul and Tokyo and the strengthening of China. After President Park took office, there have been two summits uh, between South Korea and Russia. One of the uh, uh, in the context of the G2 meeting in St. Petersburg, uh, G20 meeting in St. Petersburg, G2 has not yet formed, <laughs> <laughs> as far as I remember. Uh, and the other in Korea in November uh, of uh, last year. Uh, eight documents were signed, uh, including a removing visa requirement, establish uh, establishing cultural centers, forming an invest, uh, uh, investment pl platform, and several others. Uh, trade has reached about $25 billion. It's not too big for the region, of course, but as I said, uh, South Korea is still um, Russia's uh, third partner, uh, trading partner in Asia after China and Japan. And on January 1, from January 1, we can go without a visa to South Korea, which is, the, uh, which is very good, because it's very different from other countries of the region. For China, we still need visas, and uh, for Japan, visas to get a visa is very difficult. Well, well previous speakers said some words about China and North Korea, well, let me add some, uh, uh, China, China and Korea, and China and North Korea in particular, let me add some, something. Uh, uh, oh, this is, this is the wrong title, so, sorry. I just wanted to say, oh, to Add that future Russia, Russian policy will depend heavily towards uh, the Korean Peninsula will depend heavily on the ob overall atmosphere and the international relations, which are quite good at the moment. Mm -hmm. uh, so, if relations with Washington develop, Moscow can take more active position in urging ch China to exert greater pressure on the DPRK. In case of deter deterioration of Russian-U.S. relations, which is highly unlikely, of course, uh, <laughs> Russia, will <stick> <laughs> 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 Russia will stick to the prior line of uh, weakening sanctions and verbal exhortations to the North Korean regime or even tacit support. Uh, this is, by the way, a monument to heroes of Korean War in the city of Shenyang, which shows the Chinese feelings towards North Korea. I'm going to, uh, to, to say something about it. Uh, so in China, Ch China's uh, approach to uh, Korea's problems are somewhat different from that of Russia. Reunification of Korea is in, uh, uh, there are two views in um, China about, for example, Korea's reunification. Some experts and politicians think that reunification of Korea is inevitable and interference in this process, uh, process is mindless. Uh, and they, th they argue that China needs to develop relationship with the South and uh, make the most of the unfolding situation. There are, however, other people uh, who think that a unified, strong democratic Korea in which the United States maintains considerable influence does not correspond to China's interest since it could uh, become a serious competitor and unfavorably, uh, unfavorably impact the international situ situation in China itself. So, uh, China, uh, nev nevertheless, there are some uh, common appro appro approaches. Well, in China, they usually say that maintaining stability, uh, that China should maintain stability 
of a North Korean regime should strengthen influence over its uh, new leader, pro uh, prod him into economic uh, reform to end the deep crisis, and not to allow dangerous exacerbation uh, of the situation on the peninsula. Uh, with North Korea, China has succeeded in uh, maintaining ba balanced political. Re uh, China has succeeded in maintaining balanced relations with both Koreans and boosted cooperation with uh, uh, with Seoul, uh, climbing to more than 250 billion in trade uh, and securing 70 percent of the foreign investment investment by the, uh, by the uh, by South Korea. Uh, China's Korea policy is seen with rising concern but by a certain part of South Korean ruling elite. Well, the first speaker spoke quite, quite a lot about it. In uh, uh, so, uh, uh, officially Beijing supports and does all it can for improving uh, North Korea, uh, the relationship between the two Koreas. Uh, Beijing, for example, condemned the North Korean nuclear te tests in 2006 and two 2009, participating actively in the Security Council resolutions that imposed strict sanctions on it. Uh, Beijing uh, put pressure on Kim Jong-il, introducing economic restrictions, succeeding in stopping the nuclear weapons program, and fulfilling the joint statement of 2005. In February two, uh, 2013, Foreign Minister Yan Jiechi firmly condemned the DPRK's uh, nuclear, a new nuclear test. Uh, however, Beijing is unwilling to adopt more decisive measures. Uh, it is, on the one hand, it is dissatisfied that Pyongyang uh, created problems for, for countries in the region and the whole world. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, one should take in mind that North Korea is the only official ally of China. It doesn't have any other allies. But according to the Treaty of 1961, it is still, uh, the two countries are still, still allies. Uh, a refusal to support uh, North Korea would, uh, would, would signify recognition for China that the heroes of the war, and we saw, we saw the monument, heroes of the war who, uh, whose example is taught to school children fell in vain. And actually the entire foreign policy since at least 1950 was wrong. Mm -hmm. Convinced, uh, well, China is convinced that normalization of inter-Korean relations and long period of peaceful coexistence can uh, can open the way for gradual advance uh, to unification of the peninsula. Uh, but verbally supporting the unity of Korea, Beijing nonetheless would never agree to the presence uh, in the United Korea of foreign military bases and troops. Well, let me stop here. Okay, thank, thank you, you very, very much. much. Well, um, I'm going to open up for questions in a minute. I'm going to make a comment on, on each of the presentations, which I thought were really excellent. And I think these, uh, these papers hold together quite well if this is going to be a compendium in the future. Um, I wanted to start with uh, Professor Lee's statement about, you know, you're with us or against us and the portrayal of the, of the uh, Russia-China-North Korea axis, as it were, um, which is, he portrays as quite similar to the Cold War. I agree with uh, 85 to 90 percent of what Professor Lee said, but I think in this portrayal, it's a little too stark uh, for my take that uh, that China is uh, is all in with North Korea regardless of, of behavior. Um, and as uh, Professor Lukin said, that Russia's Rus Russia's not necessarily all in with North Korea regardless of other of actors' behaviors. I guess my point is that I think that that. Um, there are various reasons why China does not want North Korea to collapse and go away. Uh, Professor Lukin, who's an historian, uh, 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 extraordinaire in addition to being a, a, a political analyst of the contemporary world, 
points to one that isn't mentioned much. I, I talk about it quite a bit uh, when I make presentations on it, and that is that the Korean War has a strong legitimizing legacy, particularly for the PLA, but also for the CCP more generally, as it tries to find um, the ever disappearing legitimating links back to Mao Zedong. Um, they're trying to say that they're all one party throughout the history, and they're less and less like Mao, but they want to say that Mao is a great strategist, and the Korean War really is the centerpiece of that argument, that Mao's decision to save North Korea against American aggression um, was a big moment in, in PLA history, standing up to a great power. And if you look at vi then Vice President Xi Jinping's speech on the 60th anniversary of the intervention, it reads like something that could have been written in 1955. Um, uh, and it's, it's, quite, it's quite stunning to see in the 21st century. Um, and I think that's a big part of it. So there's, I, I'm agreeing with this, the thrust of it that there are a lot of reasons for China to back North Korea uh, and try to prevent it from collapsing. But I think that there are <coughs> levels of, uh, of provocation by North Korea and other results of North Korean provocations that can get China's attention sufficiently that China will adjust its policy towards uh, the peninsula in ways that serve U.S. interests and the interests of South Korea and Japan, arguably. And that's what we have to work with. We have to accept reality and work with those things. Um, and I think one of the major ones uh, is the degree of provocation by North Korea. And we saw that in 06, 07, China did put pressure on North Korea. And it did help pr produce uh, the only progress we made in the six-party talks, which was the Action for Action Plan. Um, so China can be, by direct uh, North Korean provocation, can uh, be led to adjust its policies um, uh, if the rest of the pieces are in place. And I think that uh, in 2010, we saw uh, China basically playing the role of defense lawyer for North Korean provocations for most of the year. But by the end of the year, I think uh, China got fed up with it. And I think one of the reasons China got fed up with it in late 2010 was a factor that was raised by the other two speakers, uh, by, by uh, Evans Revere and by Dr. Terry. Um, and that was the tightening of the triangular relations between the United States, South Korea, and Japan over the course of that year. And I think what the Obama administration did in that year was quite clever. What they said was, uh, we, want to do, we want to cooperate with China to solve these uh, problems of North Korean provocations and the nuclear problem. We want to work with China. But if China doesn't want to work with us, and it appeared China did not at the time, then we'll come up with other methods. And China might not like those methods. And one of those methods was to increase the security uh, discussions and, and, and coordination between Japan, China, and, and, um, and the United States, something that's difficult to do for all the reasons that were laid out here. But when it happens, I believe it gets Beijing's attention, because it's not something that Beijing particularly likes. Um, and it helps underscore the cost of North Korean provocative behavior for the region and for China's own national interests in ways that could lead to an adjustment. And if public reports are correct, China did restrain North Korea from carrying through in late 2010 with a threat to punish South Korea for a planned exercise that South Korea carried it through with, and there was no such punishment. Um, so it's a perhaps effective uh, restraint on the part of China. So I think we have to look at those things. And then we look at the two presentations on that triangle, and I thought they were, they were both excellent. Um, I think that uh, I was a little, uh, I was a little uh, disturbed that uh, in a very optimistic talk that the analogy that was offered was, you know, this, if this can work for the Palestinians and the Israelis, then it ought to be able to work <laughs> for the Koreans and the Japanese. Um, I just wish you could have come up with one where, you know, maybe Northern Ireland, I don't know. <laughs> uh, something besides the Palestinians and the Israelis. Uh, um, but when I think of Evan's comment, and I, I'll end with this, is, you know, he said that uh, hope springs eternal. And uh, 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 having worked in the, um, in the State Department, I learned a very useful phrase uh, on those days when you are very tired after a very long week, and that is that uh, optimism is to diplomats what courage is to soldiers. <laughs> so um, so you, you, have, you have to get out of bed in the morning. You've got to try to do something. And it's very, very important, uh, all joking aside, it's very, very important for the, the national security of the United States, the national security of the Republic of Korea, and the national security of Japan for these three actors to be able to coordinate their activities against a very clear common threat that I think Professor Lee laid out very well. If this isn't a clear common threat, what is? North Korea, correct? 
North Korea. It's very clear. If they can't do that, it's very bad directly. It's very bad indirectly, too, because it limits their ability to shape the choices of a rising China. And a strong U.S. presence, a strong allied presence in the region is one of the most constructive ways for us to address a rising China. Not to contain it, to address a rising China in a way that encourages China to use its increasing power for purposes that serve everyone's interests, ours and China's, and get out of the kind of us or them world that, uh, c that would look more like a Cold War than, than uh, fortunately the current reality does. And um, I'll just end with that, and I'll open it up to questions from the audience. Yes, uh, I'd just like to ask one question in, in following on uh, Dr. Lupin's, actually his last comment, that China would not support the unified Korea with a foreign military presence. So it's definitely, uh, you know, dancing around with that foreign military presence might be. And therefore, as you know, Evans was, at, was pointing out at the end game, does the end game for a unified Korea mean the U.S. needs to uh, figure out another place to park their troops and forward, forward deploy them in, in South uh, Northeast Asia? And I'll just leave that for, for Evan, really, in terms of your role in the State Department. Uh, is that something that the U.S. would be adamant about? We'll take this one by one. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm no longer with the State Department. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, now, so now you can speak. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I smile so much lately. Uh, I think the, the ultimate resolution uh, of, of that issue, uh, uh, obviously a very, a very complicated issue, but at, at the end of the day, uh, I think there's an understanding that something different will have to happen in terms of the, uh, the, the U.S. ROK relationship, the, the, the security military relationship, uh, in order to get the Chinese to buy into the notion of a unified Korean Peninsula. Uh, what that something different is, is TBD, uh, to be determined. Uh, a unified Korean Peninsula will need an insurance policy, as I always called it. Uh, some sort of a guarantee uh, of its territorial integrity uh, that it will not be bullied uh, or carved up or carved into by any of its neighbors who will go unnamed. Uh, and one mechanism for that is a, an alliance with the United States, uh, which has served very effectively uh, for all those purposes over the years. Uh, there is increasingly uh, among American policymakers, uh, including military strategists, an understanding that a reunified Korean Peninsula would not need the level of U.S. military presence that we have there now. Uh, why would you need a substantial ground force presence in the Republic of, a unified Republic of Korea run Korean Peninsula? Uh, for what purpose? Uh, there could only be one purpose, and you don't want to go there. Uh, so, uh, we will have to eventually define, as, as this process of moving towards reunification unfolds, uh, what the ROK-US relationship will look like, uh, what the alliance relationship, will, which I presume would continue in some fashion, will look like, uh, and, and what level of presence. Is it one soldier? Uh, is it five airplanes? Is it a small marine unit? Is it, is it a, a small naval unit? Uh, what, what is it that would give the ROK the, uh, the, the level of comfort that it will likely need uh, and would not be perceived as being provocative uh, by China, who's, uh, which will cast a very important vote about uh, whether the reunification of the Korean Peninsula is even going to happen. So somehow we need to find that, that, that happy medium uh, in which we maintain the sort of commitment that the ROK wants us to maintain to them in terms of their overall security. The South Koreans uh, get the insurance policy that I think they're likely to continue to need, uh, but that whatever that looks like is not perceived as provocative or potentially provocative uh, by China. That's the, the happy medium. Uh, and I've been quite surprised and impressed by the degree in talking with our military people and our OK military people, the, the understanding that that's, that's the equation that needs to be resolved in, in, along uh, the lines of just as I've described it.
So I'm optimistic that that problem can be fixed. Uh, the bigger problem, uh, as I've alluded to in discussions of the reunification of the Korean Peninsula, uh, is that uh, there are uh, s some other not so minor challenges on the road to reunification, not the least of which is that North Korea has its reunification game plan. And that game plan involves the ROK going away. Uh, and so there are several bumps in the road that we're going to have to get through uh, on, the, on the way to the day when uh, reunification uh, of the uh, peninsula takes place. Mm -hmm. Mr. Chairman, may I add my two bits on this? Sure. Uh, today, of course, very few people think that China or Russia or North Korea would support the continued presence of U.S. troops over the long term and in the aftermath of unification. But curiously, in the aftermath of the first inter-Korean summit in June 2000, that is what South Korean President Kim Dae-jung said that he had heard from Kim Jong-il, that Kim Jong-il supports the continued presence of the U.S. troops in Korea, even after unification as a stabilizing force. And Kim Dae-jung, in his op-ed in the New York Times on November 28th, emphasized that uh, during his speech on the occasion of his Nobel Peace Prize, on December 10th also emphasized that. However, the reality was North Korea from the very next day following the end of the summit, <coughs> meaning June 16th, uh, the Norong Shimun and the KCNA on the 17th and so forth, almost once a week for the next year, explicitly called for the immediate withdrawal of U.S. troops. And that provision is also in the joint Kim Jong-il-Putin statement from October 4th, 2001. Uh, Article 8. My point here is, yes, Russia, of course, North Korea, but China opposes any serious discussion on that issue. However, let me go out on a limb and say the U.S. will have a compelling strategic interest to see to the weapons of mass destruction in North Korea and will likely go in as long as that operation has a South Korean mask to it. Now, when we think of today's strategic calculations for the Chinese leadership compared to 1950, in the earlier period, China had a compelling interest in not just sitting by as the DPRK was collapsing. If China had not intervened back then in the fall of 1950, mm -hmm. that passivity would have had serious implications on Mao's standing as the revolutionary leader of the Asian Communist Movement. Uh, the formation of a U.S.-led unified Korea with Japan's support would have had serious implications for Mao's real designs on liberating Taiwan. And perhaps most importantly, the PRC had a plan B, fallback plan, in the Soviet Union. None of those conditions are in place today, so we don't necessarily have to look for any official statements by China or Russia uh, countering uh, this conventional wisdom. We don't have to look for uh, any you know, confirmation from those governments because we won't find any. But as the U.S., without any official statement, and many quite to the contrary, that the U.S. would not abandon South Korea, um, and despite that intervened in the Korean War when events took over, when events take over in the future, when there is regime instability situation, I believe there is a strong chance that the U.S. will take action and the Chinese will probably not risk a military confrontation in countering that action. Sir. Uh, I want to suggest to Mr. Terry uh, about the U.S., Japan, Korea, trilateral relationship. So the United States has been trying to put our two allies together for a long time, uh, since the days of the Korean War, really, and with, I'd say, very limited success. I mean, we were the, in some ways, uh, the force behind the normalization of relations. But even there, that wouldn't have happened if the Koreans and the Japanese themselves hadn't wanted to do it. And the meeting that took place in The Hague, which I agree was a, at least some hopeful sign, uh, really wasn't a meeting between Japan and Korea. It was a meeting uh, of the two of them with the president. And uh, it wouldn't have, a bilateral meeting simply couldn't take place. So the question is, to me, what's the what is the mediating role of the United States in this relationship? And uh, the, the American officials that I talk to say, well, we're happy to encourage good relations between our two allies, but we're not going to mediate on, mm -hmm. they actually oppose that word mediate, 
on, particularly on issues of history, uh, some of the things that you went through and that are particularly neuralgic in recent years. Is it possible uh, for us to prove, to help uh, those relations improve without actually taking on the EDM role and confronting or in some way dealing with the issues of history, or do we just simply bypass that and talk about our shared strategic interests, which by the way have a lot of time to and closer together? Uh, well, I don't, I'm not, I'm, I don't agree with the fact that we, Americans have done everything that we could in terms of really actively pressuring both Korea and Japan. I'm not asking, I don't think it's helpful for the U.S. trying to mediate and get into the actual history of Tokyo. And history, this is just not possible to uh, get involved, uh, and, and, nor is it wise. But I think there are things that we can do. For example, don't allow even bilateral meetings unless, uh, unless they are going to actually meet. Like this is, if you're going to want a bilateral meeting, either Japanese or the Koreans, may force it to make it a trilateral. That's why I said earlier, focusing on the common interests for now. And that's why I said even, even anti-piracy effort, or, uh, the, the mining effort, far away from the Korean Peninsula, go to Gulf of Aden, but do things together and create the norm and the practice of working on something else that's not related to history or any kind of uh, issues that's, you know, that's, I, I think that, while doing that, and, uh, another thing that I think Japan and Korea can do is at least don't get into this whole inflammatory actions. I think it is possible for U.S. to press Abe to not go to Yashikuni Shrine. Like after this meeting, this trilateral discussion, but I think there's ways to even force it even further. I mean, I don't think U.S. has been, US has been engaged as much as it should. Um, I even, yes, maybe that was, we're not successful in deterring Abe, but from, I think we understood after this particular meeting, it's a fresh start, at least let's not engage in further inflammatory actions. So it's not, if it's not a cooperative actions, and it's not, let's not make it more painful by, uh, and there are ways to do it, by just Abe staying quiet, or you know, the South, South Korean president not visiting Dokdo or, or Takashima, right, as Lee myung -bak did. There are ways to just n do nothing for now, and that's at least helpful. And then find ways to work on the common areas, which has nothing to do with, uh, you know, the, the history or, or, you know, their own security yeah. issues. If I could add a sentence, uh, I agree with everything that Dr. Terry said, and I think there, is, there are things the United States can do to try to discourage the types of behavior that undercut the relationship right. rather than mediate. Mediating is almost always a very difficult and, uh, uh, proposition and, and usually a bad idea for that reason. But uh, I thought it was appropriate that we criticize publicly mm -hmm. the, uh, the Abe visit to Yasukuni. Um, and I think there's two there are two ways to criticize it. One is to just say this is wrong and mm -hmm. it, this, this is offensive to us as well, not just to the Japanese. Right. And to, and to the, if you look at the museum at Yasukuni and you look at the story at Yasukuni, it, it is offensive to most Americans if they saw the history as it's portrayed there. So uh, there's nothing wrong with that. But I think the thing to emphasize in, in, in both the Korean and the Japanese cases is that they're harming their national security mm -hmm. against a very real threat. This is my favorite part of, of uh, Professor Lee's excellent presentation. This is a real clear and present danger that we're facing in North Korea. And you're not going to get a, cl a more clear and more present danger than North Korea. So uh, in the case of, of Japan, when someone like uh, President Abe takes these actions, he's somebody who claims he wants to strengthen Japanese national security, emphasize that he's weakening Jap Japan's national security. And when uh, President Lee Myung-bak, who I had a lot of respect mm -hmm. for, and uh, I think mm -hmm. he did a lot of good in, in, in many ways, goes to Dokdo and, mm -hmm. and, and, and celebrates on Dokdo, you know, say, uh, on the one hand, uh, my, my, own, my personal take on it is like, the Republic of Korea is a miracle, not a victim. Right? It's a miracle. The country's amazing. It, it, it came out of nowhere. It was so poor. It's a miracle, but it, sh it shouldn't play that role that it was playing there. And it's harming South Korea's secu security interests against a very real and present danger, which is North Korea, and I think it's not worth the candle. So you use that practical explanation as well. And I think the United States can play a role in that without getting involved in the debates directly and not playing the mediator. I, I have to raise an objection to my esteemed colleague, Dr. Terry. As a full-blooded South Korean national, you mentioned, Dr. Terry mentioned, don't allow South Korea and Japan to get together if they're going to hurl insults at each other. South Korea and Japan will 
based on their own determination meet if they want to. The U.S. tried to play that role during the Korean War. The exigencies of the war led to the U.S. arranging for the first meeting between the two sides in Tokyo in October 1951. The Korean delegate Kim Yong-sik, the very first thing he said was mm -hmm. that Japan should apologize formally for the occupation, the brutal occupation. The Japanese delegation walked out of the room and then two years later the U.S. tried again to bring the two sides together. The very first thing that the Japanese delegate um, Kubato uh, Kanichiro said was that the U.S. violated international law by uh, seizing Japanese held properties in Korea and giving them to the Koreans and evicting the Japanese out of the Korean Peninsula and recognizing the Republic of Korea before formally concluding a peace treaty with Japan and that the occupation of Korea which was compulsory was in Korea's vast interest so that Korea should be grateful to Japan. Now, we are beyond that stage, obviously, some 60 <laughs> years later. Still, yes, the U.S. can play a very productive role in incentivizing Japan and South Korea to come, to come together, as the Obama administration has done with visiting both countries next month. But I think once we go get beyond this hump, the two countries will go back for the time being to talking to each other and we have seen this fluctuation over the past several decades. Now it has lasted a long time and despite expectations of Park Geun-hye and Abe perhaps moving beyond uh, the Chile relations, relationship that, uh, that we've seen since uh, Lee Myung-bak's last year in office, you know, the fact that it's been over a year since Abe and Park Geun-hye uh, upon coming to office you know, to have to talk to each other raises concerns but I think we can be reasonably optimistic that the two countries will be more cordial to each other in the future. Could, could I add one bullet point to the excellent points that Tom Christensen made just a moment ago. Uh, I agree completely with what he said in terms of what the message needs to be to Tokyo and to Seoul about uh, the fact that this downturn in bilateral relations is harming Korea's uh, security is also harming Japan's security. There's a, another important point, and this may be the most powerful argument of all to use in Tokyo and Seoul. You are undermining America's security interests in Northeast Asia, America's ability to defend you, our two allies in the region, America's ability to defend its own security interests uh, in Northeast Asia. Uh, and to me, that's a very, very helpful point that doesn't need to be gone into in too much detail with our allies. I think they will get what we mean uh, and they will get the import of what we're trying to convey to them. So it just seems to me that that's an extra, uh, an extra argument that we should be making. Just one quick bullet point. Um, I wonder if, I'm not sure if the U.S. needs to stay strictly neutral, just to revise a little bit on what I said, on every issue. For example, on the comfort women issue, which I truly believe the Japanese are actually losing the perception game on that particular issue in the world. And for me, I truly don't understand why Japan is losing their own, risking their own interests in you know, a real issue with China over the territorial dispute, for example, over something like the comfort women issue. And I think they are losing that battle. But I don't know if we need to stay completely neutral neutral as we have done. I think even Secretary of uh, then State Hillary Clinton even phrased it in a certain way to, um, to imply that we are, you know, that Japan is not doing the right thing, particularly when it comes to that particular Well, the issue. comfort women, yeah. she, she said they were sex slaves. Right. That's, what, that's right. sort of honesty, but, that, but that's, that's, not, that's not mediating yeah. a dispute. That's right. just saying that's what you say is not just offensive to others, right. it's offensive to us as well. <laughs> Oh, sir, sir, yes. I'd like to ask a question to answer the answer you, but also in the looking to the answer. The, the impact of uh, you know, what happened in uh, Ukraine uh, on uh, North Korean issue is uh, is six body talks as dead as G8. <laughs> so how can Japan, U.S., Korea move on? How dead is the G8? <laughs> <laughs> you haven't had a chance to speak. Do you want to? Yeah, yeah. You want to start off with that? Yeah. First, you can decide whether the G8 is dead forever, and then, and then speak about the six-party talk. I'm not sure, but my friend is a uh, Russian. Uh, uh, 
as ambassador at large in the foreign ministry in charge of uh, in charge of six party talk, talks and he's very happy because he has nothing to do for what, he like can take a vacation years. vacation <laughs> on the black sea <laughs> well, well maybe i should tell tell him but i'm not sure if uh, the talks are dead or not uh, i think it's possible to resume them the the problem is that we don't know if there's and there is even the result come comes out of it of them or not so so that's the problem and you said something about ukraine did you uh you i mean the in the current situation well for russia i usually say that there are two positive things in the current situation first that uh russian experts or experts on Russia in greater demand now. Um, and second, that Russian experts of ch on China are in greater demand. Uh, and I'm one of them. Uh, so, well, of course, all this situation is a great push for Russia to go eastwards, I would say. Also, China is not in, in, in the east, but to the south of Russia, actually. But, but for some reason, we still call it our eastern neighbor um, and uh, I think I said that if uh, the city if uh, it all depends on uh, the situation uh, on, on Russia's relations with the uh, with Europe and the United States if if we cannot improve them then Russia will have no choice than to turn its attention and economic cooperation to China, of course, mostly, but also some some other some uh, some other Asian countries, and maybe it's not entirely bad because at least at least we should will be more serious about development of our own Far East and, and Siberia. Thank you. I, I, want, I wanted to say one thing about about Ukraine that worries me uh, related to the six party talks, and that is. There is a story, and this relates to Professor Lisa. The Ukraine situation is very serious. Um, I don't think it's an example of what some people will try to make it an example of. And um, uh, there's two pieces to the Ukraine crisis. One is the, the, the fall of the government in Kiev, and the second is the Russian invasion of Crimea. Um, and, and I'm afraid that some people in the six-party talks process may try to make uh, the following types of arguments. that. Um, the North Korean nuclear program uh, will appear more useful to North Korea and more justifiable because uh, a government fell in Kiev uh, to protesters um, and uh, they don't have enough regime assurance uh, from the United States, regime survival assurance from the United States and others and this only worries them just like Libya worries mm -hmm. them and other examples of fallen dictators worry them. And the other argument would be um, from the Ukraine perspective, which is um, somehow North Korea needs the nuclear weapons because Ukraine gave up its nuclear weapons and was unable to defend its territory against Russian invasion. I think both of those arguments are specious. They're understandable, they're logical, they fit together. The Qaddafi example as well, it, it fits into a story. But I think it's somewhat psychologically soothing to people who don't want to do more about North Korean denuclear, uh, denuclearization uh, to say it's really the fault of others who haven't assured North Korea enough. Because the North Korean program started a very long time ago. It started long before the axis of evil speech. It started long before the Qaddafi example. It started a long time ago. And um, it's too easy to say that North Korea is being provocative and developing nuclear weapons because of the latest potential provocation of the month. It's a longer term problem and uh, everyone's going to have to work extremely hard to bring it to an end. Since you addressed the uh, question to me as well on the six party talks, I, I think the bigger question is not whether or not it's possible to resuscitate uh, this process that's on tenuous life support right now. The bigger question is, if you get back to the table, what are you going to talk about? Uh, North Korea has redefined the goal of those talks in a very interesting way. Uh, the September 19th agreement and all the collateral agreements that followed that were about this thing called denuclearization. That was the goal of the process. 
denuclearization has taken on a different meaning. And maybe we can just wrap up, by, I'll, I'll tell you one very brief vignette from a conversation I had with a senior North Korean official. Uh, and I said to him, you have redefined denuclearization. Your new definition of it is this thing called the denuclearization of the whole Korean Peninsula. Mm -hmm. And what that means is the removal of U.S. troops from the Korean Peninsula, the removal of the nuclear, um, nuclear umbrella that the United States extends over Korea and Japan, and the ending of the U.S. ROK Security Treaty. If we do those things, I said to my North Korean friend, uh, you will feel more secure, you have told us, and you will consider consider the possibility then of giving up your nuclear weapons. And so I said to him, is there anything wrong in what I have just said to you in describing this new definition of denuclearization? And his response was, you've got it exactly right. He said, now that we are a nuclear power, the price for our consideration of denuclearization has gone up. And you have just stated what that price is. So I will just end by saying, if we get back to the table, and if denuclearization as we understand it is no longer the goal of those talks, and I don't think it is in the minds of the North Koreans, where are we? It, it's one last sentence. I was on the six party talks delegation for the United States um, in, in 06 and 07. And um, it, the, the term that comes up after the talks broke down, you hear from diplomats, from scholars, is that the United States is putting preconditions on the talks saying that it has to be about denuclearization and they need to return to their earlier commitments. We should just get back together, which to, to, the, to the common ear it always sounds like a good idea. Just get, get back together and talk. Don't put any preconditions on But these are not preconditions. To say that North Korea needs to meet its all, the obligations it's already agreed upon is not a precondition. What the North Koreans are doing is putting a precondition on the talk to say, accept us as a nuclear power by not making any requirements for our return to the talks. Accept us as a nuclear power, then we can talk. But that's basically to, to surrender to their nuclear status as a, pre, as, a, as a precondition to discussing with them. So I, I don't envy the people in the Obama administration who have to make those decisions about the terms under which they go back to the talks. I don't envy them at all. Oh, I think we're out of time. Which is, um, <laughs> uh, that, that's a factor I can't control. And I wanted to thank again uh, KEI and, uh, and my very fine panelists. So just a, a really great group of, uh, of talks, and I learned a lot from them. Thanks.